uh, Thursday, I'm all mixed up, morning, Tuesday, Thursday, what day is it? All right, Thursday, welcome to our Thursday night class, good to have you all here today. Uh, we continue on in the uh, book of Ephesians, understanding our great enemy, Satan, so we have more principles and uh, precepts to understand this evening, which we'll get right into in just a minute. Um, no really other announcements to make at this time other than daylight savings time this Sunday, so remember to turn your clocks ahead so that you're not late for church. That would be the best thing. All right, but in any case, take a good nap on Saturday because you lose an hour of sleep on Sunday, so take a nap. All right, so in any case, uh, let's get started as we normally do. We begin with a moment of silent prayer, utilizing 1 John 1, 9, if necessary, the rebound technique to ensure the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, without which we cannot learn or understand the Word of God completely, and then therefore produce divine good within our lives. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in praise and worship to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, all by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the word that you've given us this evening and the word that continues to work in our lives to give us strength and power to overcome the details of life and overcome the temptations of Satan and his cosmic system to continue to walk in your plan and in your will. We thank you for all the logistical grace blessings you provided for our church and also for our families. We ask that you continue to pour your blessings onto us each and every day, especially in the coming day, so that we can continue to do your will. So, Father, we pray for our nation this evening. We ask that you continue to watch over it, protect and guide it, leading out a president and all his decision-making authority to make wise decisions that honor our Constitution, your word, and the divine establishment principles. We also pray for our military that stands on guard on our behalf around the world, and we ask that you protect and guide them and lead them in all their endeavors, as well as our police and firemen and our utility workers who are cleaning up after the various storms we've had here in the Northeast. Father, we just ask that you be with all of them and keep them safe in all that they do. And we thank you for their service, Father, and for their sacrifice to your glory. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together this evening to fellowship and worship you through the study of your word. We ask that you lead us now in praise and in worship in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you all want to rise for our doxology, please. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Thank you very much, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, thank you for the doxology. Now let's turn our Bibles. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, which is the largest chapter in the uh, book of the Bible, or the lar of the, all the books, the largest chapter of all the books. And it's just after the middle portion of our Bible, as you know. Now we are uh, noting again the acrostic nature of this psalm, which says that uh, each one of the uh, Hebrew letters of the alphabet begins a new paragraph. And so it, with each letter, we have a new psalm, as it were, a mini-psalm within this. 
And now we are on chapter, oh, chapter 19, verses 49. And we're going to do two this evening. We're going to do the Zane, the Z, and the Heth, which is one of the H's. And then we're going to go all the way down to verse 64. Now, the interesting thing about the acrostic, again, it starts each paragraph with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But each line, each one of the uh, lines in the psalm also begins with that same Hebrew letter. Not just the heading uh, passage, but all of the passages that we have within each of these psalms, or many psalms within chapter 119. All right, so Zane, it says in verse 49, it says, Remember the word, your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your word has received me. The arrogant utterly deride me, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I have remembered your ordinances from of old, O Lord, and comfort myself. Burning indignation has seized me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes are my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. O Lord, I remember your name in the night, and I keep your law. This has become mine, that I observe your precepts. Then we have the heth of the H, and in verse 57, The Lord is my per portion. I have promised to keep your words. I sought your favor with my heart, with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your word. I considered my ways, and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. The cords of the wicked have encircled me, but I have not forgotten your law. At midnight I shall rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous ordinances. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. The earth is full of your loving kindness, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. So again, a great psalm in regard to the praise of God for his word that we have resident within our soul and the psalmist's love for that word. So... Continuing on now in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 11, we continue to note and understand the schemes of the devil as we are to understand them and be prepared for them so that we aren't sideswiped, as it were, or run over or tripped up in our daily walk as we go forward in fellowship with God. So we are to know these things so that we can understand the enemy and his tactics so that we are better prepared. And by putting on the full armor of God, we have all the defensive and offensive weaponry to withstand any of the schemes that come our way. As it says in uh, verse 6, or excuse me, chapter 6 in verses 10 through 11, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And then on Sunday, we're going to get into verse 12 and we're going to talk about the four-phase aspect of the enemy and the cosmic forces that he has aligned against us each and every day. But tonight we are continuing to understand the schemes of the devil, again, the tactics of Satan, his strategies that are designed against us. And there are seven that we are noting in this doctrine and understanding them. We noted the first four on Tuesday. Let me just review them very quickly. First, we understood that Satan, his first tactic is to accuse us before the throne of God, accuse us of the sin and the guilt that we should have and the condemnation we should have as a result of our sin. He accuses us night and day before God, as it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, as he did to Job, as he did to Joshua and Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and with the hopes that we are condemned and lose our salvation and therefore are outside of God's plan for our lives. But as you know, we have the great advocate, Jesus Christ, our parakletos, who defends us and ultimately says that we are justified because of our faith in the work that he performed for the forgiveness of our sins. Then the second strategy is that Satan sponsors reversionism in the unbeliever and in the believer as well. In the unbeliever, getting them outside of the divine establishment principles. And for the believer, putting false doctrines and false religions out there, as well as the unbeliever also, but putting those things out there so that we are led astray. and We don't follow the truth of God's word and the true simple faith that we should be having in our understanding of God and his word and our relationship with him. Instead, false doctrines are in the world to lead both the unbeliever and the believer astray. 
The third strategy that he puts out there is that he leads us to be disobedient to the word if we are learning the truth of God's word, to be disobedient to it on the intake and then in the application. On the intake through the pastor's teaching and not being under his authority through non-attendance in the services that we are taught the word of God or not paying attention while the word of God is being taught. And then on the application side, by not applying that word, when the time comes to apply it, which is really all the time, but again, not applying that in the situations of our daily life. Then number four, as we noted, that he has a strategy to frustrate the will of God in our lives, the plan of God for our lives, both mentally, operationally, and geographically. Mentally, again, talking about the intake and the application of Bible doctrine, trying to distract that so you don't think in terms of divine viewpoint and have the Christ-like nature within your soul. Operationally, so that you don't function in your spiritual gift in the ministry and service that God has designed for you. And then geographically, serving in the region of the world where God best has suited you to have great impact and great excellence inside the body of Jesus Christ. So getting us outside the geographical will means being in a place that we choose of our own rather than allowing God to lead us to be where we should be to serve and worship him. All right, so now we pick it up with the fifth strategy this evening, and we'll get into more detail in these last three that we are going to note. But basically, Satan, the devil, tries to neutralize the believer's soul through worries, fear, and anxiety. The best way that Satan can tear you down is to have you be all concerned about the details of life, the concerns of life, the fears of life, the worries of life. The best way that Satan can lead you astray is to get you all caught up in thinking about the things that are out there in this world, the problems, the difficulties, the various situations you may find yourself in, and get all worried and have anxiety because you don't know how it's all going to work out. And because we don't have crystal balls and we can't see into the future, Satan then preys upon us to get us to fear and worry because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to come around the corner uh, of our day. So by putting fear and worry and anxiety in our soul, we start to focus on those things that are before us and the things of life and the things of this world, and it takes our attention off of God his word, and his plan for our lives. So he tries to neutralize us through fear, worry, and anxiety. And um, for most people, the media is a great source of getting fear, worry, and anxiety within your soul. Get you worried about this situation, that situation. I've talked about this many, many times. You know, on the local news, they show you all kinds of murders and all kinds of crimes that are happening. And, it, and you may think it's happening all around you and it's in your neighborhood and it's going to get you and you have to lock your doors and sit in your house and live in a cocoon so you don't get injured. But basically they're taking a piece from here, taking a piece from there. And if something doesn't happen in your geographical region like New England, like we are in, they'll go to other parts of the country or other parts of the world to find some evil wickedness that is being perpetrated against people and make it seem like it's happening next door to you to get you to fear, worry, and anxiety, get you to fear about the politics of the day. Again, you go back to the national news, and you look at the things that are happening there. What's going to happen tomorrow? Are we going to be at war with North Korea? Are we going to be at war with ISIS? What's going to happen with this? What's going to happen with that? Oh, the economy is going to you know, tumble down on us. Oh, you know, the sky is falling, the chicken little mentality. The media loves to portray that to get you to be all concerned about the fears and worries of this life to get you not to focus on God's plan and the greater picture of human history that you should be knowing and focusing on and also trusting and relying upon God for the details and the problems of your life. Through that, again, he neutralizes the consistent perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine within your soul. Having fear, worry, anxiety, mental attitude sins galore, thinking bad about this person, gossiping about that person, trying to raise yourself up because if you don't raise yourself up, you're going to be on the bottom and you may not get the just rewards or just desserts that you think you should have in this life get you to think you need to fend for yourself and that God is not fighting for you. 
all these types of things, including reaction to various types of disasters that may be in our life. And uh, last weekend we had a horrific northeaster and we lost power for three days and we had another snowstorm last night and the disasters that are coming. And again, you turn on the news and it's all, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And they do it mostly so you keep watching them and, you know, they pay their bills by having the advertisers have great viewership by watching, you know, with anxiety and fear of what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next and get you to be all concerned about that and keep your eyes uh, tuned to the television set rather than maybe reading the Word of God or praying to God or maybe being out serving uh, with your spiritual gift. Even the fear of death Satan uses against people. But with that, i got to say, let him do it because it's good to have the fear of death in the life of certainly unbelievers. For a believer, it's bad to have the fear of death in their life because it does distract them from their relationship with God and their faith rests in God. But I love how he has fear of death for the unbeliever because hopefully that's going to lead them to God because they're afraid of what's going to happen next after they die. But for the believer, absolutely we should not be concerned whatsoever about our death. And just recognize that it's a stepping stone from this world onto the eternal world. As 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 and 9, and also Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, and let's look at, uh, actually, let's go to 1 Peter first. Let's go to the book of 1 Peter and look at chapter 5. So you've got the book of Hebrews, and you go to James, and then you have Peter. You've gone to the Johns. Then you've gone a little bit too far. All right, so in First Peter chapter 5, in verses uh, 7 through 9 specifically, but back up in verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. And humbling yourself means there's no fear, there's no worry, there's no anxiety. Arrogance means you are all concerned and you're worried about you, this, that, and the other thing because you're so preoccupied with self and what's going to happen to you. But a humble heart doesn't have concern for yourself because you know God's got all things in control. Then it says in verse 7, casting all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. And here's where we get the great verse. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. So we are in the world. We're part of Satan's cosmic system. Yes, there's going to be problems, difficulties, sometimes disasters. There's going to be things that, you know, in this world that try to lead us to fear and worry and anxiety. But remember, it's just a roaring lion. It's not a devouring, eating lion. It's just a noisy lion, like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just a bunch of noise. And the believer should just have that as background noise and something that isn't concerning within their life because they are trusting in God for all things in all situations. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 now and look at verses 14 through 15. Again, just go back a few pages. The book of Hebrews in chapter 2. <coughs> and specifically in verses 14 and 15, it says, Since then, or other translations, therefore since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. You see, people fear their lives because of death because ultimately they're not viewing the one who has power over death being Jesus Christ. Verse 15, it says, "...and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives." And again, because people are afraid of death and what's going to happen to them, they are slaves to sin and Satan. And many times they live their life in such a way because they think they're going to die tomorrow, so I might as well live it up today and grab all the gusto I can. Or they even do other ridiculous things about how they're going to be treated in the afterlife. And 
Again, go back to uh, the things like the uh, pharaohs of Egypt or some of the great uh, uh, leaders of China and Japan and the Oriental nations in the past and how they used to bury themselves in these elaborate tombs and then they would even make statues of army and uh, animals and dragons and all these other things that would protect them in the afterlife. And they would spend millions and millions of dollars because they were afraid of what's going to happen. There's even a business in the United States of America, I think it's, you know, uh, where cryogenics is involved, where they freeze the dead body, thinking that, oh, maybe someday science will catch up and we'll be able to reconstitute that body, regenerate that body, and you'll have your life back and you won't just be dead. Again, another falsehood of Satan's cosmic system because of fear, worry, and anxiety about death. So Satan has the power of death because sin is the thing that brings about death. But Jesus Christ has overcome sin, and therefore he's overcome uh, uh, death as well. And now Jesus Christ has power over death. And as you believe upon him, as you believed upon him for your salvation, he's given you that power over death. He's given you the strength so that you don't have to fear, worry, or have anxiety in regard to your afterlife ever again. Because you know that you have eternal security and you know you have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the sixth strategy that Satan brings to the fore is that he tries to obscure the focus of the believer. He tries to obscure our occupation with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to be thinking in regards to what is, you know, WWJD, what would Jesus do? What is the Christ-like nature? How does Jesus, how did Jesus think? How should I be thinking? Satan doesn't want that within our lives, and he tries to obscure it in many different ways. Again, keeping you from the intake and the application of the Word of God, but then also putting out all those counterfeits, as we've talked in the past, disguising himself and his minions as angels of light so that we don't have a true knowledge and understanding of the person and work and word of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by doing that, we don't advance to spiritual maturity. When false doctrines come in, like you don't have to confess your sins to God, again, it obscures your advance in the spiritual realm, and it hinders you from going forward inside of your relationship with God. And therefore, you can't produce divine good. You don't have great service to God, and you're producing human good works, which is wood, hay, and straw in the eyes of God. And there are three ways that Satan tries to obscure your focus on Jesus Christ, how he tries to distract you from being occupied with the person of Jesus Christ. The tenth of the great problem-solving devices, as we've noted in the past. And the first thing that he tries to do is to get your eyes on people rather than on God. And what does that mean? Well, he wants you not to be focusing on God for all your needs, all your wants, and all your desires. Instead, he wants you to be looking at people. This one's going to provide that for me. That one's going to provide this for me. Also, he gets you all caught up in what they're doing to you, either good or bad. And that will determine your mood, whether you're happy or sad, up or down. And so Satan tries to get our focus on other individuals of this world. And sometimes that could even be the worship of individuals like rock stars or sport stars or even politicians thinking that they're going to provide everything that we need in this life. So we look to them and we hold out for them and we cry out to them and call out to them to try to satisfy the needs within our lives. We see this as an example in Jeremiah chapter 17 in verse 4. It says, Thus the Lord... Well, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Cursed is the man who's looking for other members of the human race to be their savior. And in fact, um, uh, talking to my wife uh, today, I've been uh, uh, watching a little uh, mini-series on uh, Hitler, uh, or just, just started to do it and did a little bit this morning before I got going. But uh, basically, it was interesting how the rise of Hitler, and that's what this documentary is all about, the rise of Hitler, how he came to power, etc. And it's interesting that it all came as a result of the, the defeat in World War I of Germany and the disarray and the hyperinflation that was going on there and the you know, collapse of their society completely. 
And some few individuals came together, and specifically one very rich individual who said, what do we need? A Messiah. And he actually wrote that. We need a Messiah. And then one day he heard Hitler speaking in regard to, you know, what's going on in society, his political viewpoints, and he looked at him and said, that's him. This is our guy. And therefore, he was the money backer. He puffed him up. He dressed him up. He started to give him contacts within society and did all kinds of things to raise him up. And it's very interesting that we see that going on in our political world still today. Certain few rich individuals trying to raise other people up and get them to do the dirty work, Well, all the while, they're behind the scenes pulling the strings. Very interesting how the tactics continue throughout the generations. But again, with the people of Germany, what did they lose focus on? They, lose, they lost focus on their relationship with God. Germany actually at, some time, at one point in time had the greatest Bible scholars that this world had. And there are still writings from Bible scholars. And some say that the best translation from the original languages into a current-day language was when they translated the Bible into German. It was the best translation, the closest translation to the originals. They had great biblical scholars, but the people lost their way. Slowly, over time, Satan had them focus on other things. And then we see them then latching out and reaching out for a Messiah when all was despair. And then they get involved in the idiocy of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime and, even, and all the evils that were perpetrated onto people and to the world through their philosophy. You see how Satan can get us distracted and then not just get us distracted from our relationship with Christ, but lead us into evil. You see how we can do that when we are distracted from the Word of God? So easy it is. And especially when we look at the people of this world to be our messiahs. And as we've just talked recently about the tribulation and the Antichrist with his false prophet, it's going to be the same thing. History will repeat itself. At the disaster of the world, at the result of the tribulation, and then the warfare that's brought on in the six seal judgments that begin the tribulation, the world's going to be in chaos. The world's going to be looking for a Messiah. And the Antichrist is going to present himself as such, puffed up by another individual also called the false prophet. But believe you me, there are going to be money backers and people behind the scene for that Antichrist that are raising him up at that time even for a time. But as we've seen, he tears down three other kings to establish himself as the one ruler. And Adolf Hitler actually did the same thing. The money backer that was behind him, once Hitler got to a certain level of uh, power and prestige, even before he really took over the country at that point, in the beginning stages, when he said, I've got enough power and prestige on my own, he totally turned his back on the money backer and went his own way. And again, the Antichrist will be using people, and once he gets to a certain level of power, he's going to turn his back on all others and establish himself as the Messiah. And the world will eat him up, not the believing world, but the unbelieving world will eat him up, again, in a good way, that because they are looking for a man to save them rather than looking at the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing Satan then does is try to get your eyes on yourself. And this is what we call the big self-pity party which is a form of the arrogance complex of the soul, getting you all distracted about what's going on in your life, what's happening to you, what you have, what you don't have, what you should have, what other people have in comparison to you, and then feeling sorry for yourself and then cowering as a result. Or taking matters into your own hands and saying, well, I'm not getting this, so I'm going to go out and get that myself. And sometimes people even become arrogant. They say, well, God's not giving this to me, so I'm going to go get it myself. And that leads us into all kinds of crimes, all kinds of sin, all kinds of various evil. And actually in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, we see the picture of Elijah doing that. You all know the story about Elijah hiding up in the cave. And God came to him and said, why are you here? Well, you know, all the prophets of God have gone. They've all deserted. Now I'm the only one left. It's just me. And he's feeling sorry for himself. It's only me, and I'm all by myself. What am I going to do? And Jezebel gave him a little threat. After a great 
you know, miraculous victory that he had over the Baal priest that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Even though he had a great victory, now he got his eyes on himself. He got his eyes off of God. And he had self-pity party and therefore cowered and had weakness. But fortunately, God came to him and straightened him out and said, hey, don't worry about it. I did that for you in the past. I'm going to do more for you in the future. Go forward and now do these things. We also see example in Paul writing to the church at Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 10 and 11. But I wanted to give you verse 11 first because it gives us the story. It says, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels amongst you. And again in the church, this one's fighting against that one, that one's fighting against this one. They don't disagree here, they don't disagree there. There's factions, there's schisms, there's gossip, there's maligning. Paul said there's quarrels amongst you. And why do quarrels come up? Because we're preoccupied with ourselves. And what we have, what we don't have, what this isn't doing, what that one is doing. And all it does is distract us from our relationship with God. Then he goes on, uh, prior to that, he said, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, get your focus back. Be occupied with Jesus Christ. And all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, the only reason that there's quarrels is because there's all different people with different opinions. And what Paul is saying is, there's really only one opinion you should have. That's divine viewpoint. And if you know the Word of God and you have divine viewpoint, you're not going to be arguing and bickering and worrying about this thing or that thing. So again, when we are occupied with the Lord Jesus Christ, those problems tend to go away. But when we put our eyes on self, all kinds of problems arise, both in arrogance, boastful arrogance, and then in you know, self-pity arrogance as well. And we take our eyes off God, our provider, our caretaker, and our protector. Then we also see that the third aspect is that he tries to get our eyes on things. And as I like to say, the stuff of this world. As we see in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 16. Let's turn there now. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. But before I read that... Just to remind you, which you should be very familiar with, because we do talk about this verse a lot, a very powerful verse in regard to Satan's schemes and strategies from prior to the creation of the human race, to the Garden of Eden, to the temptations of Jesus Christ, right down to our lives this day. These same three temptations are given to us by Satan, and he tries to get our eyes on the things of this world rather than on God. As it says in verse 15, do not love the things of this world, or do not love the world, nor the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And then he goes on to say, but the world is perishing. Don't put your hopes in the world. It is passing away. So Satan tries to get our eyes on the things of this world. Again, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, as we call it, the appetite, beauty, and ambitious pride, three categories of temptation that he brought to Eve and then also brought to Jesus Christ in his three temptations. And now let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 through 6. In verse 5, it says, Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? And that is the great call and the great cry that we should all have within our lives. He will never leave us or forsake us. What can man do to us? What can man do to me? But yet when we put our eyes in the things of this world, especially in the United States of America, we, we have riches and wealth galore. And we start to look at what other, other people have and what we don't have. Or maybe what we do have because God has blessed us and we're rich compared to what other people don't have. 
When we start to be occupied with the stuff of this world, it gets us going in all kinds of different directions in the mentality of our soul and gets us outside of the will and plan of God. So again, we need to be focused on our Lord Jesus Christ, keeping our eyes on Him, not being preoccupied with the stuff of this world, and instead continue to focus on what the Word of God is all about and our relationship with Him. And be content, as Paul said. In all things, I've learned how to get along with a little. I've learned how to get along with a lot. In all things, I've learned the mystery. And then he goes on to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. We're going to see that in just a minute as well. But remember, we are to be content in all situations. If we have a lot, be content with what God has given to you. And don't be a money grabber and, you know, try to get more, 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 more. Again, nothing wrong with continuing to work hard and do a great job. And if God blesses you, so be it. But it shouldn't be your preoccupation to get more, 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 more. And if we don't have much, then we shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves because our neighbor has more than we do and therefore get involved in maybe, you know, uh, stealing or cheating in various ways to take for ourselves rather than serving God with honesty and integrity. And so the last point that we understand, and I've got some few principles to go along uh, with the conclusion, is that it's Satan's objective to involve the believer in all kinds of humanistic temporary solutions to the problems of man and the problems within the world rather than looking at the divine solutions and divine answers that God has for us. And this goes along with those 11 problem-solving devices that we talk about. God has all that we need to solve the problems that come up within our lives. And those 11 problem-solving devices are memory jogs as to what the Word of God has to say, but getting deeper into the Word of God tells us even more about what God has for us so that we aren't distracted about the situations in life. But many times, Satan likes to get people involved, especially the unbeliever, get them caught, all caught up in the humanitarian societies of this world, the temporal solutions to fix the world, the globalism, the internationalism, the hyper-environmentalism. All these types of isms that we have out there in the world are designed by Satan to get you caught up in what? A do-goodism type of mode of operation to get you caught up in human good to make you think that you're accomplishing something you're doing good and if you're doing good then if there is a god you must be going to heaven because you did good doing good gets no one into heaven but only through jesus christ does anyone get into heaven as he said i am the way the truth and the life no one sees the father except through me So part of his solution is to get us involved in all kinds of humanistic problem solving and whether that being going to a psychiatrist to solve our problems, going to a a, a psychic as you you see rampant in our day and age too, the card readers, the palm readers, let's go to the psychic and figure out what our future is all about trying to solve our problems through drugs and alcohol or some other kind of outlet of immorality. Satan has all kinds of answers for us to the problems that we may have within our lives. What we have to do is recognize that these are pseudo and counterfeits and that only Jesus Christ and his word have the true problem-solving capability that we truly need within our lives. As we see from Isaiah chapter 14, as we understand Satan and his design, And remember, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 give us a great description of Satan himself, even though it's talking about the king of Babylon and the king of Tyre. Those individuals were probably possessed by Satan, and these chapters really turn into a railing against Satan himself and also give us plenty of information about Satan and his plan, his fall, and then also his ultimate destruction. So... In Isaiah 14, we see that in order for Satan to accomplish his strategies, he has done a number and continues to do a number of things. And when we go back to Isaiah chapter 14 and look at verse 12, we see that what he likes to do is weaken nations. And remember, nationalism is the fourth of the divine institutions that God has created. 
And he created that at the Tower of Babel. Why? For the freedom and protection of mankind. Because when there's a one world government, Satan can easily control the world and control the people and truly lead them away from a relationship with God, as he's going to try to do again in the tribulation. But he weakens the nation so that there is more of a focus on internationalism. He weakens the nation by bringing heresies into the country so that God can't bless it, so that the word isn't proliferated by that nation and through the nation. Satan and his goals is to weaken the nations. And this will be one of the condemnations and judgments against him, ultimately that he rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But he also makes the earth to tremble fear, the worry, the anxiety. He tries to get everybody to be afraid. And it's interesting, if you do a history of warfare, most of the time that wars begin is because somebody was afraid of something. They weren't going to have this, or they weren't going to have that. Something was fearful, and therefore war breaks out from nation to nation, or tribe against tribe. But even so, in the individual life, to get you to fear, have worry and anxiety, as we've already talked, he tries to get you to be afraid, as it notes in verse 16. Then he also shakes kingdoms, and going back to the weakens of nation, but shaking up kingdoms as well. And it's always interesting to see Satan raise somebody up, and then before you know it, tear them right back down again. And I love to watch, like, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, pop stars. You see them, and, you know, they start off as these innocent little kids, and they work their way up, and all of a sudden they get all this fame and fortune, and before you know it, they're getting all the things of the world and this and that, and then the next thing you know, they're getting torn down, mostly because of their own sin nature. But Satan lifts them up, and then he tears them back down. And it's almost like Satan's jealous of people when they have prosperity and prominence in this world. He almost gets jealous. Even though he has raised them up in many cases, then he gets jealous and he starts to tear them down to get them back so that he becomes the one that is prominent. But in any case, shaking kingdoms, rattling them, rocking them, rolling them, having them be destroyed so that ultimately it is a weak, in, uh, weak nation, a weak kingdom, therefore it can be easily manipulated as he did with Germany after World War I and, wor you know, even in World War II. Fortunately, World War II, the Americans came in with righteousness and tried to establish something that was better and more righteous than what they had before. But when it's a weak nation and it's not a strong nation, then Satan can take control. He also makes the world a wilderness. And this also has to do with the Word of God and Bible doctrine, and he tries to stop it from being... Uh, taught and proliferated within the world. He tries to make it a wilderness where you can't find the Word of God. You can't hear the Word of God. And he does everything necessary to muzzle the Word of God. And even in our nation today is the greatest evangelistic nation that this world has ever seen and the greatest nation that teaches within its own borders. We continue to be that today, but it's much weaker than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 and 50 years ago. What is Satan trying to do? Make it a wilderness so that people can't find the Word of God. Then he also destroys the cities thereof. So talking about the local geographical areas, not just the overall kingdom or the nation, but city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, trying to tear them down. So in other words, trying to do things within your own backyard, as it were. And as I said at the outset, the media is a great tool for that, trying to get you to fear, worry, and anxiety about where you live and how you live because there's crime all over the place. Even though out of two or three or ten million people, there's one or two crimes a day. When you think about that, when all of them have old sin natures and all of them could sin at any point in time, that's a pretty low percentage of crime when you truly think about it but yet it makes it seem like it's 90% of the time. And it's kind of like homosexuality in the TVs and the movies today. The way they show it in every movie and every TV show, it has to have something about homosexuality and uh, you know, promiscuity and immorality. It always has to be something like that. And if you watch TV or watch the movies, you think, oh, it's all over the place. It's everywhere. But I think the last statistics was like less than 10% of the people in our country are homosexual or lesbians or gay or transgender. That means 90% isn't. 
but yet the media is just the opposite. It's over 90% being shown and put in your face, and 10% maybe having not uh, you know holistic or righteous uh, uh, type of uh, 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 mentality and characteristic. So he tries to destroy the cities thereof, coming right into our own backyards. And he does not open the house of his prisoners. So again, when are we talking about the unbelievers that are under his control and under his authority and leading them astray. He does everything he possibly can so that they never learn the gospel of Jesus Christ. He keeps them as prisoners and he never lets them free. Right now we're all in the house of Satan because we're part of his uh, you know, a, a, a cosmic system, his strategic system. We're all in that house. But yet you and I who have believed in Jesus Christ, who were his prisoners, have been freed. And we've been freed from that slave market of sin, and we can go forward now in the plan of God, in the citizenry of God. But Satan does everything possible to keep the house doors closed so that no one can escape and no one can gain salvation. So then as we continue on in these principles and understand these things, I've got uh, a couple of uh, long quotes that I've given to you in the notes from uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer and then Clarence Larkin in regard to Satan and his schemes and uh, the overall structure of those things and how they work within our lives. And feel free to read those on your own when you have a chance to. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, how then do we properly live in this world? as Christians and as believers. You see, we're, part, we're inside of Satan's cosmic system. Our citizenship, our polytuma is in heaven. That's where we should be. Not really, but right now we should be here. But that's where we will be one day. But right now we're behind enemy lines as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So how do we function and operate in this world? When we don't, aren't supposed to have our eyes on self and things and people and all those other things, things of the strategies that we noted in regard to Satan. How are we to function in this world that we are currently situated in? Well, the first answer to the question is, use it, but don't abuse it. You see, there's nothing wrong with using the things of this world. There's nothing wrong with having money and wealth and utilizing you know, the great electricity and the great products that we have in our day and age you know, with the new scientific things that are coming out and the new um, uh, research that I is coming day after day after day, whether it be in the medical field or the scientific field or whether it be uh, in the uh, business field or at home, whatever the case may be. We can use those things. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going to the doctor. Nothing wrong with taking medicine. But if we abuse it and we look to the doctor as our God and Savior and the drug is our end all, then that's abusing it. We can use it, but don't abuse it. It's like the money of this world. If God is blessing us with riches and wealth, as we all are blessed in the United States of America, even the poorest of the poor is blessed beyond those of other nations, you can use it, but certainly do not abuse it. Don't look at it as the end all. Don't look at it as your Messiah. And don't be living each and every day to get, you know, for this thing and that thing and the other thing and wanting more, 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 more and never being satisfied with what you have. Be content in all things and continue to work hard. Do a good job. And if God continues to bless you, so be it. But you're not doing it because you want the blessing. You're doing it because of your service to God. As we see in the second half of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 30 and then in verse 31, it says, those who buy as though they did not possess. You see, if we have the things of this world and we're able to buy things of this world, we should have it as I don't really possess it. I have it. I can use it. I'm, you know, I, I may get some uh, joy and entertainment out of it. But if God wants to take it, he can take it. And it's not a big deal. Or if he wants me to give it away, it's not a big deal. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. And again, making full use of it is that abuse and I want more, 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 more. And the world's got this thing and I've enjoyed this vacation or I've enjoyed that vacation. But now I want to live every day like a vacation. I'm going to go after that so I can have vacation after vacation after vacation or whatever the case may be. 
though they did not make full use of it. It says, for the form of this world is passing away. Now what's interesting about this passage is that it comes in the context of Paul talking to the church at Corinth about marriage. And he says, hey, if you're single, stay single. Because then you can serve God that way. And don't be looking for a new mate. But it's okay if you do get married. Nothing wrong with that. But even in that, don't look at the marriage as the end all of the Messiah. And don't be so overwhelmed and preoccupied with the marriage that it takes you away from your walk with God. And then he goes on and gives a litany of other examples, and these being some of them. The riches of this world. If you buy, then buy. But act as if you don't possess it. Remember, God, you know, has created the hills. God has created the cattle on the hills. And it's his. And all the wealth and all the riches that we have in this life, it's not what we have created. It's what God has created and then allowed us to utilize during our lives here on planet Earth. And what God has blessed us with. And typically, he blesses us with these things so that we can utilize those things to further his word in some form or fashion. So those who buy as though they did not possess and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. So you can use it, but don't abuse it. There's nothing wrong with utilizing the things of this world as long as we are not abusing and overusing them. And in other words, being preoccupied with those things to the exclusion of our walk with Jesus Christ or the exclusion of, you know, you know and again, sometimes when I hear myself say to the exclusion of my walk with God or Jesus Christ, you know, I think people might interpret that as, you know, they're never thinking about God. And that's not what I mean, okay? When I say to the exclusion of Jesus Christ, I'm talking about moment by moment by moment. And many Christians have deceived themselves because they think, well, I go to church on Sunday. I'm not excluding God from my life, so I can go live in the world for the rest of my week, and then I'm here on Sunday, so that's good enough. No, that's the exclusion of Jesus Christ. We have a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with him. And so therefore, if we're being distracted or preoccupied with other things and not having a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with him, then we are involved in the things of these, this world and we are abusing them, not merely using them. So in other words, don't put things as a priority in your life. Put greater emphasis on Jesus Christ. And don't Put greater emphasis on the things of this world inside of Satan's cosmic system. And so the attitude along with that is having a take it or leave it mentality. I can take it or I can leave it. It doesn't matter. As Paul said, I'm content with all things, with a lot or with a little. It doesn't matter to me. That's not my focus. Take it or leave it. If God wants to bless me, then I'll take it and I'll utilize it in a good way. But if God doesn't want to, or if he wants to, you know, uh, relieve me of that thing, then so be it too. I'm still okay, because I know my God will never leave me, nor forsake me. And he'll provide for me each and every day, both physically, mentally, spiritually, in all the realms. And therefore, I'm not worried about whether I have or do not have. I'm not worried about whether I can do things that other people are doing uh, that I can't do. I'm not concerned about that. I am focused on my relationship with God, and if God happens to bless me with something here or there, then so be it. I'll enjoy that because it is from my God. So that is the attitude that we are to be having. We also can enjoy but do not love the things of this world. Again, John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 specifically. But we also see in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 17, the same principle. Enjoy but do not love love. And what's love? Love is that, that preoccupation. Love is that it's your everything. It's your world. And just think about falling in love with somebody. And again, the first time you typically fall in love with somebody, you're so preoccupied with that person. You want to be with them and around them. You want to hear from them. You want to know them. You want to learn more about them. But then we are with them for you know a little bit. And I don't care too much about you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but just kidding. But the true love is basically you want to know that person, be with that person, understand that person. You want to be occupied with that person. You see, enjoy the things of this world, but not loving them is, yeah, I'm going to enjoy it while I can and while I have it, but it's not my world. It's not my end of all. And if I 
don't have this thing all the time, then that's okay too. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. And again, enjoy it, but don't love it or fall in love with it because then you're preoccupied with it and that's all you're going to want in this life is the things of this life and the blessing that really emanate from the blessings that God gave you. And when you become occupied with the things of this world, you forget the giver and you become more occupied with what? The gift. Again, the take it or leave it, use it or lose it, doesn't really matter. In your a soul, but if God has it for you, enjoy it. You know, uh, you know, eat the good food, drink the good drink, whatever the case may be. Enjoy that for the t- for the time that God gives it to you, but don't abuse it to the exclusion of your walk in relationship with God. So we also s- understand is that what God gives us in this world can be legitimately enjoyed, as long as we realize that He is the provider of those things, that He is the one that has given us those things, and Praise the giver. Be occupied with the giver and not the gift. And many times people don't have because they're occupied with the gift and not the giver. When we occupy ourselves with the giver, then basically God will continue to give to us because he knows it's not going to overwhelm us. He knows it's not going to sidetrack us. He knows it's not going to lead us outside of his will and plan. And he knows we're going to utilize these things to further his will and plan within this life. So again, enjoy it as long as we don't abuse it and then focus on the gift rather than the giver. And recognize that our dependence is on God himself, whether we have a little or a lot. As Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we also keep in mind that the things of this world are uncertain. There's no guarantees in this life. There's no guarantees you're going to have your health tomorrow. There's no guarantees you're going to be living tomorrow. There's no guarantees. There's no guarantees you're going to have a job tomorrow or you're going to have uh, money in the bank tomorrow. There's no guarantees in this world. But with God, there's guarantees galore. And there's promises and blessings. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so again, when we focus on the things of this world, those things are uncertain. Many times they're fleeting and for a moment. But the things of God are eternal and lasting. And they are guarantees. So when does our proper enjoyment become improper loving? That's another question we ask ourselves. When do I go over that step from just enjoying this thing to really be loving this thing, being preoccupied with this thing? Well, what's that? Nope, okay, thought I lost my battery, uh, my sound, but I'm okay. All right, so if you love the things or stuff of this world or even your own life more than you love God, That's a good indication you've gone over the deep edge, okay? (laughs) Remember, our love should be for God and God first. But when we start to have the things and the stuff of this world and be preoccupied with them, and our love for God starts to wane, and, you know, yeah, we still have a relationship with God. We still pray to God. We still, you know, worship God from time to time throughout our day and maybe even throughout our life, but we're really not concerned about God. What does God want me to do? What does God have for me today? We're not praying to God. We're not asking for God. We're not seeking guidance from God. When we start to look at the things of this world as more important to us and start to focus on that, even our own physical lives, we've made an idol of those things. And now we're involved in idolatry. Even though we may not be, you know, whittling out a little statue of this person or that person or this animal or that person, whatever that thing is that you are preoccupied with becomes an idol in your life. And it becomes an improper type of loving. So God has given us the power to overcome all of these things. We are overcomers already. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we've already been made victoriously. And positionally, we stand in victory. But to experience that day in and day out, we need to continue to rely upon God, 
Think about the Word of God. Worship God in our lives and resist the devil. Understand his schemes, his tactics, and say no to those things. Recognize they are what they are. And say, nope, I'm not going to go down that path, or I'm not going to do that sin, or I'm not going to be preoccupied with this thing or that thing. And there may be many things in your life in regard to people or situations or events that you have to say no to so that you can make God the priority of your life. But unfortunately, in our day and age, most people are making life a priority. Oh, I'm too tired. Oh, i got to do this. Or I have to do this thing. Or that one wants me to do that thing. We are too preoccupied with everything else in this world, and we put God in the back burner. And when we're available, then we go and worship God. When we have the time, some extra time. I don't know who has any extra time in this room, but I don't have a lot of extra time in my life. But So, therefore, I can't wait for the extra time to then give it to God. I have to make God a priority in my life. We all have to make God a priority in my life and make everything else secondary in our life. Make the other things the extra time in your life and put God as your A number one priority. Let me leave you with these verses and 1 John chapter 4, 4, it says, Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. And then in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So therefore, the believer can live victoriously in Satan's world through faith in Christ, who himself has become the victor over Satan, as we see in this verse itself. And every believer, you and I, whether a new believer or a mature believer, we have victory simply because we are a believer. But to experience that victory each and every day and win the tactical victories of the battles over your soul to stay in holiness and righteousness and to walk with God versus walking in sin, it involves victory over the habits that we have, the activities we are involved in, the people that we are associating with, and also the individual defense mechanisms that we put up within our soul. You see, a lot of times we're not putting on the armor of God, but we're putting up defense mechanisms to deflect the wrong and the sin that may be in our life and thinking that we're okay. Self-justification. So therefore, faith in Jesus makes us believers and thus overcomers and to live victoriously every day, we must put on the Christ-like nature as we live inside of Satan's cosmic system. And remember this general principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, and, and again, giving us the context of hold your ground against the devil so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. And those who have been consciously focusing on the doctrines that I've been teaching in regard to our enemy thus far, you are now very knowledgeable of the schemes of Satan. And you should not be dis surprised and you should not be overtaken because you are not ignorant. But for those who haven't learned these things and aren't p focusing on these principles and precepts, they are continuing to be ignorant. They are continuing to be deceived, many times through self-deception, and therefore they're at the whim of Satan and will continue to walk inside this cosmic system. Rather than walking inside of God's power system with the glory and victory that he has for us each and every day. So again, as we know the schemes of the devil, we can understand what they are, defeat them and overcome them through the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit emanating in our soul, which really says it's Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who are fighting and winning the battles and giving you victory each and every day. And you just need to let them do that through your faith and faith rest in God and His Word. All right, so we'll leave it off there this evening and come back on Sunday morning where we start to talk about the fourfold characteristics of Satan's cosmic system that are given to us in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. All right, so we close there this evening. We'll close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this word, this understanding of Satan and his schemes and tactics that are designed against us and against you, more importantly, each and every day. And Father, let us not be victims. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Lead us so that we can be victorious over Satan and his schemes so that we worship and glorify you more and more each and every day. And we serve our fellow mankind and the other members of the body of your son, Jesus Christ. Allow us to be focused on you and your plan and your service. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you very much. And remember, I'll see you on Sunday in turn.